Researchers from the Public Archaeology Laboratory, together with North Reading Historical Commission, the North Reading Historical and Aquarian Society, and the Flint Memorial Library, invite you area residents to learn about the archaeological investigations that were conducted prior to the building, the residences at Martins Brook and Edgewood Office Park at the site of the former J.T. Berry Rehabilitation Center. Dr. Diana Doucette will share what the PAL archaeologists learned about the people who once inhabited the area near Martins Brook between 8,000 and 1,000 years ago in a lecture with PowerPoint. I, I thought you just might like to know a little background about how this all came about. And um, when the Berry property was going to be developed, uh, one of the requirements that came about was a complete investigation, archaeologically wise, because it was a site registered with the state um, as being significant because back in the 1940s, there was a gentleman named Ripley Bullen who had done some archaeological digs along the um, Ipswich River Valley, uh, Martins Brook area. And he uh, had uncovered some significant uh, deposits of um, artifacts. So um, the Mass Historic Commission was well aware of this. and. Uh, they were notified that, of course, they knew that this was going to be developed because it was state-owned property. And um, they said that this had to be uh, investigated before any further development of the property took place. And so, uh, through the Community Planning Commission, uh, the developer was required to hire an archaeological company to come in and um, assess the extent of the remains on the property. And so Public Archaeology Laboratories in Rhode Island was hired and we were fortunate <coughs> enough to get Dr. Diana Doucette, who you're going to hear tonight, who was wonderful to work with. And uh, I was fortunate enough to spend a day out there with them uh, working and it was really an eye-opener. So uh, the extent of the work was amazing. They spent days and all day and it didn't end just with the digging because you will be able to visit the library and go to the history room and you'll be able to see a report like this. This is the report that was finally compiled. So. There is a lot of information. Um, North Reading apparently must have been something like the Riviera of, of, <laughs> of the Northeast, because uh, we do know from Ripley Bullen's um, uh, investigations and from the local farmer's collections uh, that he was well aware of that there were all kinds of artifacts in North Reading. The farmers plowed them up on a regular basis and uh, it was all over town, all of the Swan Pond area, everywhere around. So um, uh, Native American uh, settlements were here for thousands of years. So I don't, I'm going to let Diana tell you a little bit. Would you just give us the name of the report? Um, it's, it's the report from the um, J.T. Berry site archaeological data and it will be in the in the local history room and now I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Diana Doucette. Thank you. Well, <laughs> Patty just I think covered about the first part of my talk which is <laughs> great but um, I I did want to um, I'm uh, just introduce myself. I'm Diana Doucette, and I'm with I'm a senior archaeologist at Public Archaeology Lab. I've been working with them for quite a few years, and 
We um, also here tonight with me is Erin Flynn, who was my co-author on the report, and she was out at the site every day. She was the, the crew chief out there, the field supervisor. And there's also another member of the crew here tonight too, Tyler Beebe, who's an archaeologist with PAL as well. So, um, and tonight I wanted to tell you about the investigations out there, but, um, and that we did between December uh, 2005, <coughs> we started, and we completed our um, investigations in December 2006, there's, I think it was 2007. But there's, um, and what precipitated, you know, from our, from our excavations. <coughs> and we did, the, all this work was done for the developers, um, the Lincoln Properties, uh, John Noon with the Lincoln Properties, and Doug Finelli with the Guidoretz Company. <coughs> and I must say that we took a ride through there tonight on our way, <laughs> and we're just amazed. We rarely get to see what happens to um, an area um, after we leave. So it's a completely different place. Has anybody here lived there? I uh, wasn't sure if anybody was <laughs> living there. Okay, um, first I, I wanted to explain um, why we did what we did. And Pat did touch on a lot of, a, a lot of why we did it. Um, because the, the kind of work we do is called cultural resource management. And it's the type of archaeology, most of the archaeology going on in the United States today is being done through cultural resource management. So I wanted to explain to you a little bit um, about, about that. And then I'll give you a little history of, um, of the site, uh, about Ripley Bullen's work. And I do have his, his uh, report here that he did in the 1940s. And then I will, of course, we'll talk about what we actually found out there doing our, doing our investigations. So, <clears throat> as I said, there's, there's an old picture of the, of the property, and we were out there a lot of, a lot of the time in the snow, because we did different uh, phases of, of work, three different phases, and I'll explain all of those. So after each phase, we stopped and waited and before we went back out again. Um, so what we did is cultural resource management, but before we do, before cultural resource management came along, um, the archaeology that was done sort of in the pre-1960s consisted mostly of um, avocational archaeologists who were artifact collectors or members of organized groups such as the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. Some people were doing digs under in uh, controlled situations, but a lot of people had collections, and that, that's fine. Um, mm, or we see had the right. Yeah, you can't write. No. You can't write. You can't write. No. Thank you. <laughs> or there were academic archaeologists, or you know, his professors uh, in uh, universities who were going off and finding interesting sites and digging them up for their collections, and uh, with some sort of research questions in mind. And, or also professional archaeologists who mostly consisted of government employees. For instance, when the, uh, a lot of works projects, administration projects had archaeologists, when a lot of highways and things started to be built, um, archaeologists went out for um, uh, working actually as part of the government. So this is all pre uh, the laws that put cultural resource management uh, into effect. So just uh, these are the kinds of collections where, um, that you were used to seeing, and the, the types of collections people put together, uh, putting artifacts together kind of by type, how they looked. Um, this is pre-radiocarbon dating, so we didn't know how old artifacts were. Um, that didn't come about until the 1950s. So, um, and then this is the old hall of the North American Indian at the Peabody Museum at Harvard. I'm not sure if anybody ever was there. Um, now it's completely new, it's completely redone. But um, archaeology, when you thought of archaeology, it was really a lot of collections of artifacts. So it's very different today um, in the way we do it. And I'll just quickly go through this, though I mean, it's a lot on the screen. But um, there were, but it really did start coming about with a lot of development um, as more roads and parts of the United States <coughs> were developed. Um, and then the, some of the laws in the early 20th century, such as the American Antiquities Acts, to protect very um, 
very visible ancient sites, a lot in the southwest, and uh, a lot of the ruins. So people were seeing that a lot of these sites were getting destroyed, or they were, people were digging them up and destroying them. So some of these laws went into effect. And really with the whole environmental acts in the 60s and late 60s and 70s, there were some definite laws that went into effect. And now we, um, and now there, any state or federal permits that are pulled, a lot of those permits go through the state archaeologist's office. Every state has their own set of regulations, and then there are also federal re regulations. So there's different uh, types of projects that you have to have federal permits for. And we call this Section 106. So what are <coughs> the cultural resources that we are managing? Um, they are basically any kind of um, tangible or intangible aspects of the cultural systems. So for both uh, living uh, cultures and um, historic buildings as well as past cultures and um, that are valued. And they're also, and it can include sites, uh, archaeological sites, it can include, include buildings, it can include cultural landscapes. There's a lot more sacred sites now being added under cultural resources that are being protected. So if somebody is going to develop in the area, then um, a lot of these sites are somehow investigated. Not always by digging, but somehow investigated. And usually, as um, Pat mentioned, uh, the, the investigations are usually triggered by some kind of permit that needs to be um, pulled um, because there's going to be an effect on a historic site. So in this case, with, with J.T. Berry, because of the known sites that Ripley Bullen had recorded, uh, we, it, it, it uh, initiated the archaeological survey. And most... Um, most of the digs that we do, most of the cultural resource management projects are funded by the developer or if they're a state or a federal project, you know, maybe the government. We do work for uh, the Highway Department, the Army Corps of Engineers, the National Park Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. I mean, some of these organizations have their own archaeologists, but they may have one archaeologist on staff, so they hire out a company like PAL, Public Archaeology Lab. We go by PAL. So we um, will... <coughs> go out and either excavate a site or do historic planning. We also have a, a historic preservation department that does all kinds of um, um, town-wide surveys and also looking at visual effects. So if a building's going up, uh, there may be a visual effect, uh, a view shed that needs to be looked at for, that may affect the historic landscape. Many of these um, uh, big buildings, especially casinos, even a pipeline going through, needs to have a historic survey done of the surrounding landscape to make sure it's not going to impact the visual view shed. Um, when we do our investigations, there's usually there are three phases, and for Massachusetts, we call these intensive survey, uh, site examination, and then a data recovery. And after each phase, the what their, your findings are uh, assessed, and it is decided whether you're going to actually move on to the next phase or not. If we find a site, we always will recommend that the developer avoid it. And many times it can't be avoided, so then we will go on to another phase to actually find out more about it. And I'll explain the different phases. And eventually a data recovery, the third phase, is the final phase of, uh, of the project. Um, and we do have to have a permit by the state archaeologist's office. And so we submit a proposal, and we have a research design, and we have our excavation strategy, um, our collection policy, it's all there. And it's, it's very carefully reviewed, and then we have a permit that's issued to us. And we need to then produce a report like the one that Pat has um, as uh, part of our permit <coughs> obligations. And also, uh, there's different regulations for archaeologists working in, in, in the state, and um, we, everybody at least has a, an undergraduate degree in archaeology and some sort of field school um, to work uh, doing cultural resource management, and then a higher degrees to run projects, to be a principal investigator, 